Thank you, thank you so much, Luis. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here, for responding to this invitation uh, that uh, I made to you. Uh, yes, I'm a demographer. I work at UNESCO's International Institute for Educational Planning. Uh, so this is not a talk about education as teaching GIS to people, uh, but please stay. <laughs> um, I'm also the UNESCO uh, alternate representative to the UNGGIM, uh, so uh, you might have seen me there. And um, I, I label this talk Geospatial Data Science for Planning Education System, but in reality, I could have you know, uh, said something like Planning Education System with FOS4G, because this is really what it is about. Um, the good thing with being here with you today is that uh, I don't need to explain, you know, what is geospatial data, but I actually might need to explain a bit what is educational planning. Um, so I'll start with that, and then I'll tell you a bit how and why we completely transition to FOS4G uh, in the, the context of that work. And finally, I'll show you a, a sample of the tools that we developed over the last few years and tell you about the challenges that we have and opportunities for collaboration. So when I try to explain what is micro-planning to, to people, I kind of tell that it's like playing SimCity, uh, but in real life uh, and with education only. Um, so the, 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 our target users are really uh, technical officers in ministries of education, either at the central level in a capital or in district offices or decentralized offices. Uh, and because we work at the micro level, so school level or at the most district level, uh, we call this area micro planning. And so micro planning is really, um, hmm, this is uh, super, oh, super, not super active. Uh, it's at the intersection of policy and implementation, location and communities. So basically we're trying to, to take the, the legal frameworks and the rules and the regulations in a, in a, in a country and the Ministry of Education and apply them as efficiently as possible to the realities of the communities. And so we try to kind of bridge theory and practice and uh, location and people. And so the, we're really a small team. Uh, Haman and I uh, are the most visible part uh, of the team, so you know, many of you know us already. Uh, but we have a, a, a bunch of colleagues that also work more on the research side. So our, my team is really the development, like experimental development, um, but we do um, uh, back up our experimental development with uh, research and uh, literature reviews. The way that we work uh, is that, um, uh, we try to be as uh, collaborative as possible and we really rely on uh, open source software and free open source software, but also on free literature, uh, open literature, open data, so that everyone can, can replicate what we do. Uh, the micro planning or educational planning has started uh, decades ago. The institute was founded in 1963 and since then we've been uh, working uh, on, on micro planning and building these education system with the geography. But at the time, uh, there was no ArcGIS, there was no QGIS, there was no, I mean, databases of, well, like in the way that we understand them today. And there were no like individual laptops in ministries of education. So now we have a great potential to kind of really r r look at the old practices and completely review them um, uh, to make them like more, uh, efficient today. Um, the challenge that we had in the past, we still have them, some of them at least. Uh, you know, we work with boundaries that are not always super clear uh, because they're not administrative, they're education relevant. Um, we work with, you know, uh, concepts as, as flows of students between, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary education, technical uh, education. Uh, typically, a student will go from, from one grade to the next and never come back, but yet they might drop out and and come back in and so that's kind of adding a level of complexity and this is only for students because we have the teachers we have the inspectors we have ministry staff and so forth so it's it's not always very simple but it's always fun so these are some of the nice old visualization from the 70s that I always like to, to bring up because people were doing this stuff by hand so we have to acknowledge the effort right um, the, 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 the FOS4G in general is really at the core of our work because, um, well, we have a small team, so we cannot do it alone, of course. Uh, and, and, and typically, not all 
ministries of education have a fully dedicated team to geospatial data analysis, or that uh, their, their team, if they have one, is not fully trained, or you know, spending 100% of their time on this. So we have to make sure that we really uh, reach as many people as possible. So that's why Phosphor is super interesting. We can really uh, share a, a, to as many pos people possible and have this kind of tipping point or you know, a critical mass uh, of, of people that can uh, use um, the tools and uh, the data work that we will do. Um, and also uh, remain independent, uh, remain autonomous. What we say, you know, with the sustainable development goals, of course, we're targeting SDG 4 on education, but I always say that we, we work on SDG 4 by way of SDG 16, right? Strengthening institutions, and this is uh, all, all what our work is about. So the tools that we create, we want them to be data light because we want as many people to, to be able to, to use them, uh, but documentation heavy. So we try to really uh, give every detail on how to use the tools that we develop, uh, how, like a step-by-step -step guide, and we want to make sure that anyone can be really um, autonomous in using all these tools. Of course, we provide training and we provide support for users, uh, but uh, anyone can, can uh, you know, work on this uh, alone. Uh, we want our work to be replicable, uh, and so that's why we engage also with uh, code check uh, that will go through our codes and give us this, you know, validation that uh, our code is totally replicable. Uh, but we want our work also to be to be customizable. So we want everyone to look at, you know, what is the the tool, the package providing, but we want them to customize. It's like if we were providing a recipe, but the Ministry of Education is choosing the ingredients. And so that's kind of the metaphor I found to to explain uh, what type of balance we find between, you know, standards and, you know, basic uh, viable analysis and uh, the relevance to the, the, the context. Uh, all of this allows us to have a fast rollout, an easy rollout, uh, and we want, uh, I mean, that's, that's the objective, right? We don't want things to lag uh, and also that uh, uh, providing a minimal, minimal cost. So um, next I'm going to show you a bit um, a few of the, the products that we prepared over the last two years, I would say. Uh, you know, some people go to, um, to Phosphor-G because uh, it's free, free of cost, like free beer. Uh, but uh, this first product, I, I mean, I really pushed for it because I was just annoyed with people using bad estimations. And so, um, these are my, my free puppies, right? You saw this conference yesterday. Um, and so, a, one of the challenges that we have in education is that we need to know where are the learners, uh, but we need to know where are the appropriate learners for the appropriate educational level that we're providing. Translation, it means that if I'm building uh, a primary education in Turkey, I need to focus on a, on a four-year age group of people because primary education in Turkey is four years. If I work in Ireland, anyone from Ireland? Well, primary education is lasting eight years. So I need to make sure that the population that I'm targeting is eight year age group. Now, most of the population that we have available at a large scale or even nationally uh, in many countries is provided by um, five year age groups. And so that's a, that's a problem because it doesn't fit at all the education system, but yet, you know, it seems that uh, everyone is uh, uh, using these anyway. So basically what we do is that we take World Pop uh, specialized estimates by five-year age groups, to which we apply spring multipliers, which is available in open access. And so we specialize specific school age population based on the exact uh, age ranges of the education system. So this means that we can do um, very uh, specific estimates for catchment areas, for districts, for provinces, and know for pre-primary, primary, secondary, whatever educational level you want to look at, even for single years of age, of course. Now this is a province in, uh, in, uh, in Madagascar, and when you work with this population estimates, it's cool because you can then you know, match it with UNOSAT, uh, uh, rapid mapping services when there's a uh, disaster, and you can, oops, uh, yeah, and you can use this twist and um, actually identify which area were flooded next to a cyclone, after a cyclone, and really target the schools that are in the, these areas and provide remedial services to primary school age, or in this case, the whole uh, school age population uh, in that area. Um, as a note, um, I will, uh, you will see that you have all the links to the papers, to the QGIS plugins, uh, and to the GitHub. And in any case, uh, you will have my contact at the end if you want to get in touch. 
So another tool that we uh, worked on uh, is catchment areas. This is one of the key um, elements that we need when we plan an education system because we need to make sure that, well, uh, learners that live around the school have actual access to that school. We focused on walking distance, um, walking time mostly, and uh, we want to make sure also that that school is big enough to host all the people that live around it. Uh, if you were in Riku's session this morning, you heard a bit about this project, um, and it's really nice because it allows you to actually not only um, generate information on how far or how long does it take for children to walk to school. So this is by like 15 minutes iteration. So the dark green is 15 minutes and then half an hour, 45 minutes and a full hour. Uh, but it allows you to also see, you know, how accessible is your school system. If your learners need to walk an hour, not the same experience as if they walk 15 minutes. Um, this uh, tool relies on um, uh, the road network. So we take the road network from OSM. Uh, then we sass out our Grasshopper uh, and AWS instances with, uh, with Gizpo, uh, and then we uh, run the code that is uh, on QGIS on a plugin. Uh, but in, the, in some cases, you know, the road network is not available. So what do we do? We just drop it? No. We organize a um, mapathon or a campaign uh, with OSM and UN mappers so that we can uh, really build this road network together and then uh, run the estimations for the ministry. It's really cool because in Madagascar, the ministry uh, is already using these, these estimates for the next, uh, the coming school year. So it already has an impact because it's so easy to use. Then, well, when we run programs, in education, we want oh, any ministry really. Uh, we want to make sure that these programs are efficient and we want to know where they have an impact. And so running geographically weighted regressions allows us to see where uh, programs have the most impact. So what we did in this case in Colombia is that we looked at the relationship between school feeding programs and learning assessment scores. And so we could see that the school feeding programs were more uh, efficient on uh, increasing uh, the, the attendance and then the learning scores in uh, different areas. So it means that should that program be reconducted the year after, well, the ministry might want to focus in areas where it really needs, it really has an impact. Maybe cut in some areas where it has no impact or maintain it, but maybe roll it out at a different pace. So it just, I mean, we, we do all this to inform decisions, right? We don't say cut this, do this, whatever, but it's really to kind of add some information in the decision-making process. Voila, um, I'm not sure about the time. I think I have some more. Um, we are also very cognizant of the fact that climate is changing, it uh, has impact on our structures, and so we have this um, MCDA model uh, that should be online on uh, the plugin repository in next month um, that allows uh, the ministry to identify the most suitable locations uh, on the territory or where to build a new school, but also to identify the locations that are a bit more hazardous so that we can maintain the existing schools with the right uh, mediation so that uh, the schools can remain in, uh, in functioning um, uh, format. Ah, this is a cool one. You know, in education, you know, you have these inspectors or supervisors, right? They go and visit the schools once in a while to make sure that, you know, the teachers teach well or that the curriculum is well or that the school itself is maintained in school improvement programs. And so one of the challenges that literature, literature tells us is that uh, inspectors do their job, but they really lack time to visit or they lack the resources to actually get to the school. And so this is kind of a real blind spot for education. And so we work on these... Um, uh, optimization uh, circuits uh, for the inspectors. It's super challenging. The model, like, it's probably twice this kind of uh, decision making because there are so many different variables to take into account. Uh, but this is a really cool one. Uh, we don't have a uh, publication scheduled, so still time to contribute to version one. Um, but this has a really um, uh, great potential in improving the number of schools that get visited or the frequency at which schools get visited. Uh, and this is another one, uh, I, perhaps this is the last one I will show. Um, it's um, interesting because it seems, uh, as per literature and research uh, in open access tell us, is that there's a relationship between uh, rainfall uh, and the number of school days that children can spend in school and their uh, scores in uh, learning uh, or exams, let's say. So basically the idea is to look at 
how the rainy days are distributed in a, in a calendar year and see if a tweak in the school calendar could actually increase the number of good learning days in school and therefore might have an impact on, uh, on the learning. And so this is super experimental, still time to contribute. Um, and uh, it's really kind of uh, uh, challenging the, you know, historical, uh, colonial and, uh, you know, traditional ways of thinking about school and school calendars. Now, this is the time for my inspirational quote. Uh, yesterday, I heard uh, advice like, be a good ancestor. That's really cool. Uh, be brave, I heard. Yanni said, be brave. Uh, my, it's not, I mean, you take inspiration if you want, but I'm thinking that using phosphorgy is really a revolutionary act. Uh, we're uh, challenging the existing system every time that we collaborate and that every time that we, we contribute to, uh, to a project. And so that's why the work that we do in educational planning is so exciting. It's because it's really affirming uh, our capacity to contribute and uh, our capacity to, uh, I mean, recognizing also our interdependence. Now this, this like second part, I mean, the first part is mine, you can quote. <laughs> and then the second part is from uh, Silvia Federici, it's an Italian philosopher that I was reading on my way here. And so uh, uh, I think we, we should remain in this posture that we, we are really changing the world. And as uh, Federici is saying in the, the, the book that I'm reading right now, is that when you are next to a, an erupting volcano, it really shows that uh, working collaboratively uh, and um, uh, together uh, makes this new world, this, this uh, changing world, uh, this more common world uh, a reality. Uh, and so um, I thought I would leave you on that thought. Uh, and I would be happy to connect. Take some questions, maybe, um, or continue online. Thank you. Thank you.